Hey everybody, this is JD Gaming back with a new deck profile for you guys. I was able to build and refine this strategy over the long winter break, so uh, please welcome the very first introduction of the Psychic Crane deck. So, as you'll see in just a little bit, uh, it's basically a psychic strategy that runs Crane Crane in order to leverage its cards into the extra deck monsters that are the main players of this show without bleeding all your cards every turn in order to access the extra deck. So the way this profile is going to go is basically I'm going to go through all of the main deck cards and then extra deck in kind of an alphabetical by card type fashion, similar to how you see on like Dueling Network if you alph alphabetize the entire deck. And then if you wish to stay for, you know, the next chunk of minutes. I'll basically be going through my thought process as I built this deck from the very start. It's a lot faster than it used to be, so hopefully you enjoy that. And if you don't, then, you know, just watch the first couple minutes and net deck that to your heart's content. So, thanks guys. Hope you guys enjoy this. Alright, so we're going to go over both the main deck and then the extra deck with a little bit of emphasis on uh, introducing each of the extra deck cards individually in this video. Uh, partly because it is quite a diverse toolbox of rank 3s and level 6s that some of you may ne have never seen before, and I just want to make sure that I go over them at least once on my channel. So, here we go for the main. We run two copies of Card Trooper, two Card Card D, two Construction Train Signal Red, three copies of Crane Crane, a bunch of hand traps that start with two Effect Veiler, two Gores, two Max C. We have a Neospatian Grand Mole. One, Cyblocker as tech. And uh, just a comment real fast, I'm avoiding the middle here because of the glare in my dorm, so bear with me on that. We have two copies of Psychic Commander and one Teched Jumper. One, Redox, Dragon Ruler of Boulders. Three of our Recruiter, Serene Psychic Witch. And two, Tragoedia to round out the monsters. Should be 26 of them. Then for the spells, we have two Creature Swap. Three, Emergency Teleport, two Forbidden Lance, two Pot of Dichotomy, and three Pot of Duality. One Raigeki and one Soul Charge should be a total of 14 here, uh, which will give us a total of 40 cards for the main deck. And then we're going to go over the extra deck right now, one by one. So first we have Armades. Reasoning for this is his ability lets you shut down your opponent's responses to his battles, whether he receives or sends out an attack. So it's very useful in my metagame against um, baiting out Necro Gardeners. It's useful against stopping Gore, stopping Honest, stopping Blackwing Kallet, the Moon Shadow, and a variety of other effects. You know, you can use it in the higher metagames um, against like Shadals and such, as you all know, so I just felt it's too much of a very useful utility, level 5, to not play. Then, of course, Beast and Barkeon. I mean, what would my deck be without Beast and Barkeon? Uh, very useful. Uh, Beast is useful against the increasing trend of spell cards played in the upper metagames, as well as just, you know, Black Whirlwind, Reinforcement of the Army, and all these other key spells that allow the decks in my environment to run. And then Barkeon's just a quick crane crane target that, or crane crane goal, that lets you block off all your opponent's traps. And since there are plenty of duelists playing, um, you know, the traditional traps in my meta, it's a nice choice uh, over MST. And then we have Goyo Guardian back. Of course, he's allowed it too, but Space is a little tight, and uh, I definitely do like his 2800 attack and like the plus 2 style steal ability, but uh, only one copy in this deck. We play one Black Rose Dragon in case something goes wrong. You basically go Cyblocker into this guy. Cyblocker has the 4, fill in the 3 with a Psychic Commander, destroy the field, get rid of all your opponent's floodgates while their cards are locked down by Cyblocker. Mistworm. So now, this is a card that a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with because they're like... Mistworm used to be good, but is it worth it now when you have to invest three cards to bounce three of your opponent's cards back just so they can reuse them? Well, my argument was, if you can actually bring this guy out efficiently and it's worth playing, you're definitely running it. And in this deck, uh, as I'll go on to show you in just a second, in the actual deck profile, like the detailed deck building process, Mistworm is extremely easy to summon with Witch of, uh, Serene Psychic Witch and Crane Crane. Uh, and a variety of other ways to keep free level 3s on board, so very easy to bring out, so that's a non-issue. And then if you consider the fact that you can bounce back 
in upper metas. You can bounce back Dantes and Shadal fusions and such. That's pretty useful. Uh, you don't trigger any destruction effects or grave effects, and you get to get rid of all your opponent's things at once so that you can attack safely. And then in my metagame, it was just a useful, you know, decent pick because uh, it's a bunch of rogue strategies where they'd commit a bunch of Xyz and Synchro to the board and then Mistworm would clear them all out at once. Leo, you have uh, Redox and Gores and the tokens giving you so many level 7s that you can turn into a 10 with a level 3 tuner. And his invulnerability, you know, star manpower just makes him so hard to get rid of against certain strategies. And then if you have uh, Crane Crane, you're probably playing Xyz monsters as well. So this here is a 6 card Xyz suite. We have Ghost Trick Alucard to destroy set cards once per turn. We have Mechquipped Angoneer to protect any key monster or itself from any form of destruction for the turn. We have one Acid Golem to abuse with Creature Swap and just serve as a huge beater. Uh, one Nightmare Shark. Basically, this is the Direct Attack 2000 monster that's the rank 3, I guess, counterpart to number 82 Heartland Draco, if you know that from the rank 4. So it ends games at a 2000 life point threshold, or even 4000 if you're lucky. Triage Levia. So this thing's kind of like Mistworm in that he needs three materials to summon, three are level threes. He has 1800 attack, and anything he kills in battle is banished. Well, doesn't seem very useful. Until you read the rest of his effect and you realize that during either turn, he negates an effect of any monster and then reduces the attack of that card by 800 points. So he's a pseudo 2600 beater that banishes anything he kills and negates an effect during either turn. Very easily a uh, powerful control card over the opponent. Then we have uh, Zen Mines here. Zen Mines is just an all-around great uh, rank 3. You can set him as a defense, obviously. Not so good, or not quite as good as Engineer in terms of raw defense for the turn, but uh, still powerful nonetheless with 2100 uh, defense and is, of course, deterrent destruction ability. Um, Zen Mines can also, of course, as you know, just ram your opponent, get rid of a card, and a fun fact I'll share with you guys, Zen Mines is pro pronounced Zen Mines uh, because he's actually supposed to be a landmine, hence that pronunciation. And in uh, Japanese, I do believe Zen Mai, pronounced that way, is supposed to be uh, the term for wind up. So that's why you see that type of AI, I guess, motif in the um, wind up's names. Then we have Downward Magician. If you don't know what she does, she needs two level 4 spellcaster type monsters, which I play none of. But she has an alternate Xyz summoning condition. During your main phase 2, so after you've attacked, you can overlay her on top of any Xyz monster you have that is rank 3 or lower. All these guys so far were rank 3s. And basically, for each material, including that monster that you used, counts as an Xyz, uh, you get 200 extra attack, so her 2100 attack can easily go up to 25, 27, maybe 2900 attack points, and she does piercing damage. The only caveat is that she does lose one material every time she battles, so she does bleed those materials out, but you have the huge advantage of, you know, go and use your Xyz monster's abilities, like Alucard, kill a card, and then, main phase 2, after you attack with him, turn it into a stronger monster that your opponent cannot take out, and then your pluses actually are consolidated into something that your opponent cannot get back at you for. So uh, it's basically to make sure that whenever you gain advantage off your rank 3s, it sticks, and your opponent isn't, uh, isn't as able to defend themselves because you have a piercer on board. So a very unique, somewhat iffy card. It's kind of tricky to use, but it's pretty powerful. And then one Draco Sack, basically when you have... Um, Gores, Redox, and Trag that can copy either of those. It's so easy to bring out a rank 7, and I felt Draco Sack was just the best generic rank 7 that there was for this deck. So now we're going to go ahead and look at the main deck. Alright, so we just went over the extra deck here, and the main purpose of going through that one by one is basically the whole point of this deck is to bring out these very powerful cards in order to gain advantage over the opponent uh, with the toolboxing strategy that the main deck provides. So basically, we're gonna go over the engine one by one right now. And I'm basically gonna go through this deck as quickly as I can, uh, explaining choices as I go, basically as if I were building. This is basically how I came up with this strategy. So 
We play three teleports. I'm not going to go over too much about this core psychic engine. You can check a variety of my other psychic videos uh, where you where I go over this. But basically, three emergency teleport and three serene psychic witch. Essentially, for combo plays, uh, for both of them, teleport's basically the faster version. Both of them recruit. We have two copies of Psychic Commander, a level 3 tuner, who becomes a 1900 beater, essentially. And then we have one copy of Psychic Jumper. A note on this uh, that is different from the other decks I've done with Psychics is I found Jumper is very nice, but with this deck, uh, other than going for our, like, you know, these fives, you rarely will use Jumper as a tuner monster. So this effect is valuable, but you can search it off of Witch or Teleport. So I decided to run one copy so you don't end up dead drawing it. So just a new personal uh, decision based on where the new deck is headed and where the extra, basically based on what the extra deck has this time around. So the main thing with this new strategy is we are running Crane Crane. I had been experimenting with Crane Crane before, but I, I really wasn't sure how I wanted to use it. And now I feel like we have a decent enough rank three pool that Crane Crane is really worth running for both Synchros and Xyz. So if you don't know what he does, it's basically uh, whenever he's normal summoned, you get to target a level 3 monster in your grave and special summon it. Its effects are negated, and you can only activate one Crane Crane per turn. But that's it. There are no other restrictions, so it's very similar to Tour Guide, recruiting a free level 3. But that can be a tuner, and you are allowed to Synchro. And obviously, you can go for Xyz summons as well. And then any effect that activates in the graveyard, not on the field, is no longer negated. So if you have a variety of the other cards, like you saw Witch, you'll see some other cards here. Those will activate as well. So the whole point of Crane Crane is you get to set up some really massive plays and just some more consistent plays. Um, a really common scenario is you'll begin by setting your Witch. And when that dies, you're going to fetch your Psychic Commander. And it gets banished by Witch's effect. Next turn, you get to bring out the Psychic Commander. I apologize for that glare. I can't do anything about it in my dorm, but it is what it is. But anyway, if you normal summon a Crane Crane, Crane will bring back the Witch. All of a sudden, you have three guys you can now work with. You have these two you can Synchro or Xyz with, and this is just a Defender or Safe Attacker because she will activate in the Grave. Or you can use all three of them and Xyz summon the Triage Lefia for control over the opponent, or you can even just sync all three for Mistworm, or hopefully when it comes back off of the Forbidden and Limited list, Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier. So uh, basically, you're getting free cards off of Witch each turn, or at least replacing her so that you're not losing anything. Uh, this makes it really easy to just normal summon into a Synchro or Xyz without losing any cards other than just the one. And of course, Crane Crane is a one-card Synchro or Xyz on its own, so basically, uh, not only can you put together bigger combos like this, but you can actually get more economical combos off, and you're not bleeding cards just to access the extra deck of star players that we went over. Now, this is the card I've tested the least so far, so it is um, my most iffy pick at the moment, but it's still very nice for the time that I have tested it. Card Trooper, you obviously know, is a veteran card, uh, can become a 1900 beater, mills so that it can load the gray for your Crane Crane, and Pot of Dichotomy. Um, and then a uh, in nice interaction with this is that uh, you can obviously bring it back with Crane Crane so that it is a recruiter in the grave in a sense that it floats, lets you draw one card. But uh, if you summon this, mill three, you can attack over your opponents like Lavalval Chain or Thunder King Ryo, and then... Uh, your, your opponent thinks that you've left yourself defenseless, but what actually happens is they're being set up so that if they attack you, you can now drop Trigoidia as early as your opponent's first turn. And when you have Card Trooper, let's say you went first, you have five cards, one of them is Card Trooper, summon one, mill three, so that you have Trooper, three in the grave, and four left in hand, one of them, let's say, is a Trag. What ends up happening then is your opponent attacks your card trooper, you take a little damage, but you draw a card into your fifth, and you summon Tragoidia. So now you're back up to 3,000 attack and defense. You could easily protect yourself for the entire turn should they go off that early. And uh, then starting next turn, you can leverage it into a big beater if you need to, and then anything milled to the grave can be Tragoidia's uh, level-changing effect as well, so you can go for Synchro and Xyz play. So Trag becomes a very nice... Um, hand trap here, not only because it protects you, but in this deck, you can do a lot of damage to your opponent just by playing one card from your hand each turn. Because your witch floats, and you have, you know, teleports and stuff that you can just bring free cards to the board, you're easily able to just play one card at a time with your 
everlasting field presence to go into your extra deck. So your hand tends to remain big, not because you can't use the cards, but simply because you don't have to use them all. And when you have Trag as this really big threat, your opponent has to burn their Regeki on or something, then your later plays become a lot safer. And if they can't deal with it, then they're probably screwed just because it's a 3,000 beater, or 3,000 plus beater easily. So there is, of course, two Trags. And along with that, Gores is very nice in this deck as well, just because you get that extra token, you can sync into Leo with it because it is a level seven, seven plus three makes 10. And then uh, Gores itself obviously is very powerful as well. Uh, so it makes it worth playing no traps just to run the Gores. And the reasoning, some people have been asking me this, the reason I play no traps in this current build is basically, I feel that if you're playing very few traps, let's say you're running Treacherous Trap Hole alone, a card that says if that's your only trap, uh, and you have no more in your grave, you can activate it, destroy two monsters on the board at any time. Well, the problem with a card like that is, right now, it is very common for everyone to be main decking three copies of Mystical Space Typhoon, and I don't want to have my one card that's set killed, when by not playing traps, my opponent's you know MSTs are already all dead. So I have basically gotten a virtual plus by making it so that they have no targets to hit, and... Uh, you know, that plays very nicely into Gores, who will protect you anyway, and as I'll go through in just a second, there are a ton of other hand traps that I play that will end up protecting the, the deck's position. So it's not like you're letting your opponent do whatever they want by playing the hand traps. Uh, you're simply controlling them through hand traps instead of through regular traps. And it also is less vulnerable to Denko Seka as well. And then an interesting interaction, as I'll go over later, is basically um, you're less likely to hit when you side deck in a continuous card uh, continuous Floodgate if your opponent sees that MST is completely dead against your deck, so this deck has that unique advantage of baiting your opponent to side out their MSTs. So we have those. We have two copies of Effect Failure and two copies of Max C. Basically I wanted to go two and two on these very standard uh, cards. They're very good all around against just rogue strategies, which basically my metagame was completely made up of. We had like Frog Monarchs, Black Wings, Zombies, um, a dark deck that is somewhat similar to, I guess, Teledad in the sense that it plays the uh, the um, Malicious Plague Spreader engine, but um, that is my brother's unique creation, I won't spoil it. Uh, that definitely made it so I needed to play Effect Failure because he has a first turn combo that lets you get rid of both hands, and so, yeah, I didn't want to play into that and just lose, so Valor was a must there. Didn't want to run three, though, just because, one, it wouldn't be fair to that deck, and two, um, I just felt that going four hand traps would be more balanced for the other matchups, and uh, that combo wasn't consistent enough for me to worry about maining three Valors all the time. Sometimes I did feel like it, but, you know, it turned out sometimes that uh, that was just me thinking and overreacting and thinking that I wanted to get rid of it with three Valors, but anyway... Two construction trains. So this is a pet hand trap of mine. If you don't know what it does, it was from Dragons of Legend. It's a level three earth that reads, when your opponent declares an attack, you special summon this from your hand. Your opponent must now have that attack switch to this card, and this card can't be killed by that battle. So if you have a key monster on board, for instance, Armades, great if you can keep him alive in, you know, the Bujin matchup. Nichiria Beast, great against Cleaforth Shadals and Burning Abyss with the new uh, slimmer trap lineups there. So, you know, protect Nichiria Beast. We have, um, sometimes Leo is killed by being run over by a bigger monster. It's rare, but that is actually a pretty common way that they get rid of Leo, so that's a way. You have guys that will, you know, give you extra advantage the longer they are on board. And if you can protect these guys, then you get more use out of these cards, overall causing more damage to the opponent. So I felt that Construction Train is a natural fit for a strategy like this because not only is it a useful protect your key monster hand trap out of nowhere that no one seems to know about, but as a level three earth that summons itself to the field and doesn't die, hopefully, um, you end up having a shortcut again into summoning just anything from your hand just play one card exceeds or synchro and all of a sudden uh, it fits in with the strategy of you know have witch recruiting your stuff or uh have crane crane bring out free monsters so very nice card for all of those traits then i play two card card d for draw power and the reason i play only two card card d is basically between 
three witches, two card cars, and two card troopers. There are just so many opening plays you can do with this deck. And in addition, when you combine the fact that we have Pot of Dichotomy in this deck, uh, you basically are able to recycle card card D so much that oftentimes in the late game especially, it ends up dead. So I'd rather only play the two copies since I'm not in dire need of that first turn card card D. Um, to give you an idea, if you look through this so far, we have six Psychics, three Winged Beasts, a total of six machines between the card troopers, card cars, and the uh, construction trains. We have insects and uh, spellcasters. We have four fiends, so like plus the extra deck. So many different types. Dichotomy is almost always live in this deck, starting like turn two or three. And so um, I just felt overall it would be a good idea to run two card cards to help boost the opening turns, but then afterwards just recycle them with Dichotomy, which will give us more draw power in the long run anyway. So uh, basically it's for the sake of balance to make sure I don't dead draw the card cards. We play three duality, which of course can, uh, works very nicely in conjunction with the three cards or the two cards we just saw right now. Uh, plus, it works nicely when you're just setting witch or getting a hand trap to your hand, just something you can easily sit on and stop without special summoning. So, duality boosts our consistency overall very nicely. Then we play two forbidden lance. I played these over MST in my metagame because out of like the eight or so decks. Like, two of them played unknowing cards that I would want to MST, and the rest played either very few or zero back row. Like, to give you an idea, Frog Monarchs, no back row, you know? Um, so, I just felt that, you know, against Black Wings, I wanted to protect myself from Icarus attack. Against the Zombie deck, I wanted to protect myself from just, like, Compulse and, you know, traditional traps. Uh, and then, of course, it works nicely against uh, Dark Hole, Raigeki, and even a one-turn protection from Snatch Steel, so you can get your guy back and do something with it. So overall, Lance was just much more versatile in the environment, and I liked it so much that I'm actually considering, uh, when I go back to my locals pretty soon, I'm actually thinking, like, locals here at uh, university, I'm thinking of playing these alongside MSTs, or at least citing these, because um, I haven't been there in quite a long time, and going into an unknown format, I just feel like Lances are versatile enough to at least side to protect yourself from all those power cards. Then here's just a bunch of tech. Lance was technically tech, but I felt like since it still fits into the category of protect yourself from back row, and um, yeah, I felt like that's still a core component of the strategy to ensure it goes off. So these are our tech choices. I'm going to go through them now. We have two cr uh, creature swap. Obviously works well with witch. Um, it's pretty funny when you're able to do the previous crane crane combo where you have witch, commander, and crane crane, and then crane crane has 300 attack, swap it to the opponent, have their guy, synchro or Xyz, attack into a crane crane for tons of damage. Uh, you could also do that with any of your other hand traps. If you're finding Veilers or Maxi or Subpar in a certain matchup, just give them to your opponent, kill it. And then it works nicely against certain strategies that run, you know, protect the monster dot deck. So it's like uh, Bujin Yamato or Evil Swarm, as long as they don't have... Um, you know, protection against creature swap. Uh, I guess Evil Swarm is kind of a bad example because they do search their own infestation pandemic, so they protect themselves from the effect of creature swap. But against like Bujins or against Necros or any other ritual deck that's going to be playing the, uh, what was it, the Jin Releaser rituals, you can play creature swap. And since it doesn't target, you can steal that guy, hopefully. And, um, yeah, you'll be good to go from there. And then of course, if you give your opponent Acid Golem, it's just the most mean thing in the world because uh, they can't special summon. And as long as they're not Cleforts and they're able to tribute it easily, they're not really going to love you that much. They're going to hate you. We have one Raigeki. Um, I used to play Dark Hole in a deck like this because it has so many floaters, but basically Dark Hole I decided to move to the side just because um, I didn't feel like I needed this type of mass destruction ability in my metagame, uh, at least in the main deck. So Dark Holes recited, but Raigeki's still good because basically if you're attacking to win, you're probably going to run Raigeki, unless all your opponents are expected to be completely invulnerable to destruction. We play one Soul Charge. No crazy combo in this deck with this, unfortunately, but still an amazing card nonetheless. If you are interested in seeing a crazy combo with Soul Charge, um, check out the... Terra Quasar deck profile I have on my channel. It's basically back when Soul Charge was a 3, I made a really consistent Quasar deck that summoned Shooting Quasar Dragon t first turn. Like, I don't know the exact probability of it because I've never calculated it, but it was pretty darn high. So you'll find that interesting if you like Soul Charge. 
And then the monster tech, we have one Redox. If you have a dead card car or crane crane or witch or tuner or whatever, any earth guy can be used to monster born with this, so that's great. And then if you have Redox in your graveyard, you can easily go drop Trag at any point in the game, even when you have no cards later in the game. Choose your Redox, it becomes level 7. Bring it back from the grave by banishing some stuff, and then stack for Draco Sack. And all of a sudden you have this really nice beater that came out of Trag, a dead Trag, and a Redox that was just sitting there in your grave. That's one of the reasons why I decided a rank 7 was necessary for this deck. Uh, because Redox, you know, has just so many more uses that way. And then we have one Grand Mole, toys with opponents who like playing one monster on the field at a time. Especially if they're trying to defend themselves and you're getting a free monster every turn, you know. Grand Mole can really seal the deal right there. And then Psyblocker is a very nice problem solver card. Uh, basically, if you don't know what it does, it is a 1200 attack level 4 Psychic that reads, Once per turn, you can declare a card name. And cards with that name and their effects cannot be used until the end of your opponent's turn. So you may find that that's similar to a card called Prohibition, except Prohibition does not let you get rid of effects or cards that are already on board. Cyblocker does. So let's say my opponent has this Armades on board. Armades makes it so that the opponent of the controller of Armades, in other words, if my opponent has it, I have, you know, I'm locked down by Armades. I'm not allowed to activate any cards or effects in response to Armades battling, whether I attack or he attacks me. And it's a light monster, so if he wanted, he could even go and honest and all that stuff, you know? Basically, whatever is most annoying to me at the moment, I can call that, even if it's on board. So let's say it's just Armades, right? Call Armades. Now all of a sudden, I am allowed to activate the effects of my cards during battle. And, um, you know, maybe I have a hand trap that I could play, like a Forbidden Lance or something, with another monster that'll help me run him over. I'm allowed to do that all of a sudden. Opponent's Thunder King Ryo. Call that. And Thunder King can no longer stop me from searching or from, you know, special summoning. Works very nicely against Vanity's Emptiness because you can call Vanity's Emptiness won't shut you down anymore, teleport into a level 3 Psychic Commander, sink for Black Rose at 7, destroy everything if your opponent's overcommitted with Floodgates, and all of a sudden they lost all their Floodgates at once, so very nice card right there. Just such a high utility card, and the fact that you can search it easily with Serene Psychic Witch whenever you need to means there's no reason not to play it at 1, because you'll have so much more reach by playing that one card. Kind of like the jumper argument from before. All right, so this is basically the side deck that I've been running in my metagame. Now, uh, to give you an idea, the metagame had uh, frog monarchs, it had zombies, it had black wings, it had um, some old style dragons, um, it had a junk doppel deck, and um, a variety of other strategies as well. There's a handful of others. Uh, so. Basically, this is what I felt was great for that environment, and it'll hopefully give you an idea at least of what types of cards work very nicely uh, synergistically with this type of a deck. Um, so it might give you ideas for siding if you want to play it in your metagame. But um, this is for my environment, just, you know, disclaimer right there. So I played three DD Crow because with Treeborn Frogs and Necro Gardeners and Zombies everywhere, DD Crow is just so amazing. It was, in my opinion, a staple in that metagame. So very nice card there. Two Dark Hole, again, I said, Raigeki, you basically play in anything that you are attacking to win with, so long as all your opponents aren't completely invulnerable to destruction. Um, and in my meta, you know, it's more of an old-style rogue metagame, so, you know, Dark Hole is still good, but I just felt I'd, I'd rather play things like Creature Swap and such as well. Um, that worked better with the deck. Then I'm siding the 3 MST, because, again, although I didn't like the fact that a lot of decks played no back row. Black Wings still have Black Whirlwind, so there was a thing I wanted to get rid of. And then a zombie deck that I played against basically has Zombie World, which turns everything on the field and in the graves of both players into zombies. And then um, he comboed that with Rivalry of Warlords because everyone else played no zombies. And essentially what that does is if you have them both together, everything's a zombie on board. So if I summon, you know, if I summon DD Crow here, he's a zombie. And then... The If I have another monster in my hand that's not DD Crow, don't have one on me right now, but basically, let's say this is another monster, I'm not allowed to summon him right now because this card is not a zombie, but the thing on the field is. And it's essentially a two-card combo that's like uh, Kaiser Coliseum in limiting all the opponents from summoning more than one monster, while the zombie deck is actually free to summon as much as it wants. So 
Very annoying card um, for both of those. And then that deck also played Solidarity to boost all the zombies by 800 per Solidarity. So yeah, there were definitely a lot of continuous annoying things I wanted to get rid of with Mystical Space Typhoon. The reason I didn't main it though for that type of Floodgate is um, if Serene Psychic Witch dies, you basically bring out Cyblocker and call Rivalry of Warlords and you can do like that Black Rose play to get rid of it. So uh, I did have that in the main as a backup, but, um, or as like a primary way of taking care of it, I guess. MSTs were just backup, and in an environment with very few traps otherwise, I felt not worth the duck space to main. One Snatch Steal. I put this in the side, so let me quickly explain. The reasoning was that because I don't have the full spread of levels for Synchro Monsters that I usually do, I felt that it would be best to play Snatch Steal in the side, because there's no question about it. It is a powerful effect, but I can't guarantee I'll be able to do something with the monster since I don't tribute, and, you know, I'm missing levels like 8 and 4 and, you know, above 10, things like that, so... Snatch Steel would only be useful, really, if I hit a certain monster that I could Xyz or Synchro with, or if I hit a boss monster, and that wasn't always a viable thing, so I felt, you know, let's play things in the main that are a little more consistent. So yes, Snatch Steel is a power card, but because it wasn't a major tournament, decided to go with it in this side. For this meta, I played 3 Fairy Wind, gets rid of Solidarity, Zombie World, and Rivalry all at once. Gets rid of... Uh, Vanity's Emptiness, along with Black Whirlwind in the Black Wing deck, stuff like that, so... I don't know, it was just unnecessary evil in this deck, because I hated those Floodgates so much. And then after some testing, I always like some sort of back row hate in a deck like this, because I run none, obviously. So I decided to run, and I know this is so awful, right? Two Ultras and one Common Decree. But anyway, uh, I decided to run Royal Decrees over Trap Stuns, because this deck, as efficient as it is in getting damage on board, it's not necessarily going to OTK your opponent. So I felt that the long-term defense that you get from shutting down all traps forever with Royal Decree made for a better card than Trap Stun. And yes, you can easily say how, you know, if I were playing this against, you know, Cleefort infested meta, everyone would be maining 3 MST, so that Royal Decree would be destroyed. However, Two things you must keep in mind with Royal Decree in the context of this particular strategy is that, one, I wasn't playing it in an environment with Cleeforts and stuff. I was playing it in an older rogue strategy where um, not a lot of people were playing MST at three in the main deck. So that's one factor that made me choose Royal Decree for its permanence over Trapstun for its invulnerability to MST. The second thing is, of course, the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, if I'm playing a deck with no traps anyway, it's very unlikely people are going to want to keep MST in the main deck. It's just too much of a liability. Um, so, assuming that they make the smart decision to take out MST, I am now safe to play Royal Decree against all of the uh, Floodgates and against all the annoying you know, Icarus attacks and D-Prisons and compulsory evacuation devices and all that stuff um, and have a lasting effect. Of course, it does technically conflict a little bit with Gores, but I am only losing two cards in my deck to my Royal Decree that I could just easily side out, depending on whether I'm going first or second and whether I'm running the Decrees. And then there is the fact, of course, that Royal Decree is going to have a far more harmful effect for the opponent than myself uh, locking out my own Gores, because if I sided it against a deck that's literally playing a third to a half of their deck is Traps, which, you know, that's part of the reason why I played this sometimes, um, I won't have to worry about most of their cards because they'll end up being dead, or at least a good portion of them. So that was the intention there. Uh, because Royal Decree in the environment I was playing was more likely to stay alive, and just because of the nature of this deck, it was a little more likely to have MSTs in the opponent's decks be sighted out. Made for a great fit. Um, then for tokens, I literally played... These are my Mecha Phantom Beast tokens. They're just fluffy and easily spawnable, I guess. And then, uh, of course, two Gores tokens. Now this I did not have over Winter Break. I actually ordered them and got them once I got back here to the dorm, but I'd like to discuss this card in detail uh, for just a little bit because I feel like it is amazing in this strategy. So, Solemn Scolding, if you haven't seen it, is from New Challengers, the newest set besides Secrets of Eternity that technically, I guess, is the newest set now. Uh, it's a counter trap that reads, if it's the only set card in your spell and trap card zone, 
a non-issue in this deck. Uh, when a monster would be summoned by either player, or a spell card, trap card, or monster effect is activated, you can pay 3,000 life points to negate the summoner activation, and if you do, destroy that card. So it's a combination of Solemn Warning and Solemn Judgment. People are just like, oh, it's a watered-down version of Solemn Judgment. But you have to realize, this thing stops summons or effects of anything, whether or not they summon. So if you have Naturia Beast first turn and set Solemn Scolding, and Naturia Beast shuts down a deck like Cleaforts or Shadals, then what are they going to do when you have Scolding to shut out their one out? Um... You know, definitely a very powerful control card that will be very useful against certain strategies. Uh, against other decks, of course, you're not going to really want to play Solemn Scolding in game one because you just don't know whether or not it's worth 3,000 life because then Gores becomes in jeopardy because your life goes down so quickly. Uh, that's why I recommend citing this. Uh, definitely worth citing up to three of them because it does have that really powerful control aspect against any deck. And another reason that I considered citing this, even uh, now that I have it, is if you're playing against Denko Seka, do you really want to have this set and have Denko keep it face down so that you can't summon Gores? Kind of a bad scenario. Like, you can pay 3,000 and kill the Denko Seka, but then they can Chaos Summon with it, and your Gores is now 3,000 uh, life less for you to actually come out, so... Uh, that was a weird sentence. But basically, Gores is not likely to come out and save you as much if you have 3,000 fewer life points. So it's a little bit of a risk in the main deck, but in the right matchup, it is simply amazing. And so I definitely recommend that you guys consider this for a deck like this. So there you have it, folks. This is my new Psychic Crane deck that I refined over the long winter break. Hope you guys enjoyed. Feel free to test it out for yourself on DevPro, Dueling Network, or in real life if you so choose to build this strategy. And let me know what you think in the comments, whether or not you've tested it. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed this deck as much as I did putting it together and playing around with it. It's definitely a lot of fun if you like this, this type of uh, trapless psychic strategy. And uh, if you like playing with the extra deck as well. So thanks, guys. This is JD Gaming, and I'll see you guys next time.